please have a seat. And as you're doing so, Dennis, the guy on the mandolin is going to come forward and, and bring the word to us about atonement this morning. Thank you, Dennis. Currently, I'm going to be speaking about atonement this morning. First, let me pray. Lord Jesus, you paid a debt you did not owe. <clears throat> we owed a debt we could not pay. We needed someone to wash our sins away. And now we sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus, you paid a debt that we could never pay. Amen. And that concludes my message on atonement. Seriously, do we, need to, do we need to know any more? However, since we have a little bit more time this morning and you've bothered to come, I've got some other thoughts I'd like to share with you. Everyone believes in atonement, at least to some degree. Atonement is the idea that a wrong should be set right, a debt should be paid, a bad deed should be punished. And I don't know anyone who would really disagree with this. How often have you heard it said, I hope I've done enough good in my life to make up for the bad. We all agree that something should be done about all the bad things people do and the bad things that happen. That's the idea of atonement. Where we differ in our thinking about atonement usually comes in the application of it. Who should be held responsible? Who should pay? Who should be punished? That along with questions such as, can a wrong ever really be set right? Does punishment for a wrong deed really accomplish anything for the person who was wronged? Now, my personal preference regarding atonement is that everyone should be held responsible for all the stuff they do and should receive appropriate punishment for their misdeeds. In fact, the sooner the better. I really don't like it when the wicked prosper. I believe everyone should receive quick justice, that is, everyone else. I'm really not too keen on getting what I deserve, and if I'm going to get it, I'd just as soon put it off as long as possible. Or better yet, I'd like to put the punishment on someone else. Well, you can imagine my delight when I read that my idea of putting the punishment on someone else for my bad behavior was scripturally sound. Oh, happy day. What a great idea. I sin, someone else pays the price. But not so fast now. There's just a wee bit more to the picture than that. So let me just rewind a bit and we'll get into the collateral clauses involved, the fine print, if you will. Like I said, almost everyone thinks atonement is necessary. The problem comes in the application of the principle. I believe all religions recognize that we humans are not perfect and we should do something about it. All other religions put that responsibility of doing something about it on us, the doers of the bad deeds. These other religions say we must do something to make things right. What sets Christianity apart from all other religions is that we recognize that we humans can't really do anything about it. But someone else can. And in fact, he already has done something about it. Jesus died on the cross and rose again, conquering death and paying for our sins. We call this substitutionary or vicarious atonement. That is, someone else makes atonement for us. Now, let's talk about a little bit about per terminology here. Just what do we mean by atonement? I'm going to try to look at these things from God's perspective that is, what happens between God and us? First, let me tell you what atonement is not. Atonement is not mercy or forgiveness. Mercy and forgiveness are gifts of God that he gives us once atonement has been made for our sins. They cannot be given unless atonement is made. 
because God's perfect justice must be first satisfied. Also, atonement is not redemption. Redemption is the blessing we receive with forgiveness. God forgives our sins because they've been atoned for. The price has been paid. The penalty has been meted out. And God's perfect wrath and justice have been satisfied. We then experience redemption, a restoration of our intended relationship with God. We are involved in mercy, forgiveness, and redemption only as recipients. But none of these gifts is atonement. Atonement is really a combination of two things. A couple of big words here for you. Expiation and propitiation. Simply said, atonement accomplished by Jesus' sacrifice both turns away the wrath of God by being the acceptable sin offering. That's the propitiation part. And it covers or does away with our sins. That's the expiation part. 1 John 4.10 says, In this is love that not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Hebrews 9.26 says, But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been revealed to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's expiation. Atonement in the biblical sense paves the way for the repairing or the restoring of our relationship with God because God's perfect wrath and perfect justice have been satisfied. Atonement required payment, propitiation for the sin through the death of the perfect sinless sacrifice and thus covered or did away with our sin. Because we human beings cannot fill the requirements of being the perfect and sinless sacrifice, we're left with no hope unless God himself intervenes and comes up with a way to be able to demonstrate his perfect justice and his perfect mercy at the same time without diminishing either one of them. And wonder of wonders, he did just that in Jesus. So here's four things we need to constantly remember. One, we had absolutely nothing to do with atonement. Atonement for our sin was a transaction completely within the Godhead. Two, within the Godhead, the Son makes perfect atonement for our sins by the sacrifice of his perfect self. Three, the Father accepts this perfect sacrifice as atonement, and his perfect wrath and perfect justice are satisfied. Remember, that's the propitiation part. And our sin has been covered and put away once for all. That's the expiation part. And then, four, the Holy Spirit then applies this perfect atonement through the gifts of salvation by grace, through faith, forgiveness, mercy, and redemption, and we are restored to a right relationship with God. And now is when we come into the picture. But we are simply guilty bystanders. We had nothing to do with the atonement process. We paid no price. It cost us nothing. We simply receive all the benefits. Well, that's not totally correct. We did contribute to the atonement process. Our contribution was our sin, which necessitated the need for the atonement. Second Corinthians tells us, He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. That's vicarious atonement. And it's only found in Christianity. Someone else makes atonement for you because you can't do it yourself. You take out vicarious atonement and you get all the other religions which teach you that you should or even could atone for yourselves. Now, often we make that mistake. We, 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 we want to put Ephesians 2.10 back up to, into Ephesians 2.8 and 9. Remember, Ephesians 2.8 and 9 says, By grace you're saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then verse 10 says, for you are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. We want to push those good works a little bit up into the salvation part of that, okay? But that's not where they belong. The good works are just our response 
to what God has done. Okay, so we're clear on that. Now, vicarious atonement. Can't do it ourselves. I'm going to do something very dangerous for someone to do when they're doing a sermon. I'm going to give you an illustration of just how important vicarious atonement is to Christianity. The danger is that you'll remember the illustration but forget the application. But here goes anyway. So there was these two guys and they're walking through the forest. They're hiking through the forest and they come onto a clearing. And in the clearing they see this huge hole. Holes probably 20, 25 feet apart, across, just a huge hole right in the middle of the clearing. And so, you know, the guys do their, their, they look over the edge and one guy picks up a rock and he wants, because he can't see the bottom. He picks up a rock and he throws it in the hole and he listens. Nothing. Okay? Bigger rock. Gets a bigger rock, throws it in the hole and both of them are looking over there and they're listening. Nothing. Finally, they get the biggest rock they can find, and they both heave it in the hole, and they're listening. Nothing. That hole's deep, okay? So over at the edge of the clearing, they spot, they spot a log there. So, so they, the two guys get on the end of the log, and they drag this log over to the hole, and they, and they manage to get it in the hole, and, and, and they're, they're waiting for the sound. And all of a sudden behind them is this crashing in the bushes. And out of the bushes comes this goat in about three bounds. Boom, boom, boom. Dives head first right down the hole. And they're standing there just dumbfounded. And all of a sudden they see a guy. A third guy comes out of the, out of the bushes and he approaches the two and he said, Hey, have you guys seen a goat? And they look at each other and they go, yeah, it's the weirdest thing. We're standing here, and this goat comes crashing through the bushes, boom, 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 and he dives headfirst down the hole. And the guy says, nah, he said, that couldn't have been my goat. I tied mine to a big old log. <laughs> now, now, don't miss the point here, okay? The log is vicarious atonement. The goat is Christianity. If you throw out vicarious atonement, you throw out Christianity. You're left with a do-it-yourself religion that can't be done. So, back to atonement being a transaction totally within the Godhead. Then I've got a question. If that's true, then why did Jesus have to become a man? Totally within the Godhead. Well... Good question. I'm glad you asked because that's where my notes go next. Turn to Hebrews 2, 14 to 18, and I'm going to read this for you, and then we're going to talk about five things that tell us why Jesus had to become a human. Hebrews 2, 14 to 18 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For clearly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brothers so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. All right, five things that tell us why Jesus had to become quick, uh, human. Quickly, you'll want to go back and study this passage. One, Jesus needed to be made flesh and blood because we are flesh and blood. And atonement needed to be made in the form of flesh and blood. Two, we needed help. Angels did not. Three, Jesus needed to die as a human and rise again as a human to conquer death, to destroy the devil, and to free us humans from the fear of death and the slavery of sin. Four, Jesus had to be like us to become a merciful high priest to, to make propitiation for our sins. And five, Jesus had to be tempted as a human to help us who are tempted in our humanity. Why did he need to become man? I think the most amazing four words in the Bible 
are those words in John 1.14 that says, the word became flesh. Jesus became a man. And by, by becoming flesh and blood, living the perfect life, Jesus was able to fill the requirement of being the perfect, sinless, human sacrifice required as atonement for humanity's sins. Okay, that takes care of our eternal destiny as Christians. But what about all the messes that we've made along the way during our lives? What about the harsh words spoken? What about all the selfishness, all the broken relationships what are we to do with them? To be sure, we have the, the spiritual tools of confession, repentance, and forgiveness, and we should use them often, regularly. But there still the, remains the problem of having done the dastardly deeds in the first place. Those spiritual tools are wonderful, but they can't undo what's been done or unsay what's been said. So we've got a problem. It's called regret. Or maybe sorrow. Now I know Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But there are some things I've said and done that I wish I could unsay and undo. But I can't. Maybe you do too. What's to be done with those things? Is there any hope? What about all the other messy stuff that goes on in the world? Every day. You've probably noticed this world is a mess. God created a wonderful place to, for us to live, and we've made an absolute mess of it. Read the news. Shootings, drunk driving arrests, contract disputes, threats of strike, lawsuits, drug arrests, political protests, sexual and domestic abuse. And that's just the sports page. The whole world is a mess. It's a swirling cesspool of unrest. Wars, disease, political dissension, social injustice, Bombings, racial atrocities, the list goes on. So I began to wonder whether God had a plan to deal with all this. And I wondered if perhaps the application of Jesus' atonement is not complete. I don't mean for you and me. And I know that, that there are people who have not been born yet who by faith through grace will receive the benefits of atonement. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about setting right all the wrongs that have been done. Then I remembered a passage in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. And I'll read that for you too. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, and made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And then he who sits on the throne says this, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, right, for these words are faithful and true. Now at this point, maybe you're a skeptic. You might raise a really good point, something that says, okay, all these working together for good, magnificent glories to be revealed. No more death, mourning, crying, or pain. All that sounds pretty good going forward. But what about all those injustices, the hurts, the broken relationships, innocent sufferings of the past? What will God do about those? Do those just remain unrectified? It's the age-old question of evil and what's to be done about it. Well, the honest answer is, I don't know. But stay with me for a minute while I follow some thoughts. What I do know is this. One all sin will be punished. And these, there's Bible references there you can look up later. Some of us, too, some of us will plead the blood of Jesus and be forgiven because he took the punishment for our sins. I also know that others who have rejected the blood of Jesus by unbelief will be punished forever for their sins. I know that there will be no more sin. And five, I know that 
All things will work together for good for the redeemed. And six, I know that there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things will have passed away. Those are the things I know. What I don't know is whether or not there will be any other wrongs that need to be made right when Jesus returns. Will there be the other collateral damage, damage done to innocence and unforgiven, injustices unrepented, wounds unhealed, relationships unmended, things that are just not right? Will these be left unresolved? What about all the horrendously bad things that happened through the ages, unspeakable things that humans did to humans? What happens to them? And then there's the question of natural disasters and the carnage they have produced. I think these are reasonable questions an honest seeking skeptic might ask. Hey, forget the skeptic. I'd like to know the answer to those things too, wouldn't you? So here's where my thoughts went. I know that God is a just God and he cannot abide in justice. Deuteronomy tells us, for I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness, without injustice, righteous and upright is he. And I also know that when it's all been said and done, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. No one in that day will be able to raise an objection to what God has done. All will bow in amazement and wonder. And I just can't imagine God leaving any loose ends, any unresolved issues. So in my puzzlement, I began to think about Revelation 21.5, where he who sits on the throne says, Behold. I am making all things new. What do you think he meant by that? Well, I think obviously he was looking and saying, look, the new heaven and the new earth. And what else could he mean by all things? I think the important thing to note here is that he who sits on the throne is not saying, I am making all new things. No translation I could find rendered it that way. They all say, Behold, I am making all things new. In fact, the original Greek doesn't even have the word things in it. Apparently, translators felt it was implied. The Greek really says, new, I am making all. Every single translation that I read said in the English, I am making all things new. With the implied meaning of a regeneration or a renewal of things. And you know, Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 19. Speaking to his disciples, he said, Truly I tell you, at the renewal or the restoration of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, I've heard a lot spoken about the 12 thrones and about the judging of Israel. I've not heard much talk about this renewal thing that Jesus is saying. He said, Behold, I am making all things new. So if Jesus is saying that he is making all things new, he is renewing everything. Just how all-encompassing is that? Could it possibly mean righting every wrong, curing every injustice? Would that be possible? How would that work? Well, how should I know? I'm just throwing out these ideas for you to chew on. But if you're asking me, If you're asking me, could the God of the universe, who created everything by the word of his mouth, who holds all things together by his word, who is not bound by time because he created time, can he somehow undo all the bad stuff that has ever happened in the history of the world and make it like new, like it never happened, or even better yet, like it should have happened? I'd say, well, I think so. He is God. And as I thought about this more, I thought, if God wanted to do something like setting everything right, he might start 
with doing something really radical, outrageous, crazy, something really impossible, something like maybe raising everyone from the dead. Oh, wait, he already said he's going to do that, didn't he? Yeah. And thinking along those lines, I believe I'm in fairly good company because C.S. Lewis alluded to this idea in a couple of his books. In The Great Divorce, he says, both good and evil when they are full grown, become retrospective. Heaven once attained will work backwards and turn even agony into a glory. Lion, the witch, in a wardrobe. Lewis has Aslan the lion explaining about the curse being reversed by the deeper magic the witch didn't know about when he died for a sinner. He says the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. Now understand this. I'm, I'm just supposing, okay? I'm just wondering how all this is going to work out. I, I can't find a scripture that says this is exactly what's going to happen. But I can't find any scripture that would exclude this from happening. Just suppose it is true. Does that bring you new hope? And beyond that, new confidence in our almighty God it does for me. There are things that I've done and said that I regret. I have just been despicable. There are people I've hurt and relationships I've damaged. And even though they have been covered by the blood of Jesus and repented of and forgiveness asked for, still there remains the regret and the stain of sin. Perhaps this will all be long forgotten in the new heaven and the new earth, but it would be nice to know that God somehow set things right. For there will come a time when what we see will no longer exist and will be replaced by a new heaven and a new earth and God himself would descend to the new earth to come and live with us forever. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. We will live forever, never to die, and we will have no cause to be sad or cry about anything, nor will we ever experience pain of any kind because we will see with our own eyes, that Jesus has made all things new. A verse from an old hymn came to mind this morning to me. Rock of Ages is the hymn, and the verse says, Not the labors of my hands could fulfill thy law's demands. Should my zeal no respite know, should my tears forever flow. Not for sin, all for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. And this really does conclude my message on atonement. Let me pray. Amen. Oh, Lord Jesus, <clears throat> fill us this morning with thankfulness for the atonement you have made and the hope that you promised that you are making all things new. And fill us with a new confidence that you can do all things, things beyond even our wildest imagination. And now him, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and to Christ Jesus to all generations forever. Amen.